Yeah, we're here at the fairgrounds in St. John. You can see behind me one of the helicopters the Spokane County Sheriff's Office used to circle the area. We saw a couple of them up in the air a little bit earlier today. If you take a look over here behind me, there's not as much activity going on. We have Washington State Patrol, Spokane County and Whitman County Sheriff's Office here on scene. Now it, it, it's a little bit different, I'm, I'm sure, but we haven't seen the actual scene of where Justin Robertson is refusing to leave the residents in St. John. Now, law enforcement told us that he could have could be armed and dangerous, and so they want us to stay here to ensure our own safety. Again, looking at this video from earlier today, we saw those helicopters up in the air. We did see SWAT drive by at one point, but again, here back at the fairgrounds, this is kind of a command center for law enforcement to work out of. As we mentioned, uh, Robertson is negotiating. He's refusing to leave the residence near St. John. Now, earlier today, I went to Spokane County Courthouse to to look up his criminal history and it shows he does have uh, multiple domestic violence cases against him all leading up to prior to when the divorce papers were filed with his wife. Take a look. Justin Robertson's wife served him with divorce papers on March 14th. In those documents, a protection order was filed at the same time, where she requested he have no contact with her or their five-year-old son, Ethan. Another protection order was filed in December last year. In these documents, she writes, Robertson put a tracking device in her car and would follow her and their son on multiple occasions. She says in November, she was in the car with Robertson when he drove into oncoming traffic three times and asking her if she was ready. There's also mention of Robertson being suicidal since that incident. His wife said at one point he was no longer going to behavioral health appointments. Just days before the divorce papers were filed, she says he threatened to harm himself and her with a knife if she didn't obey his commands. He screamed and slammed their patio door, even saying he should have ran them into traffic when he attempted to do so back in November. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the good news here is the five-year-old son, Ethan, is safe and he has not been harmed. We're still waiting for any developments from the residence where Robertson is refusing to come outside. I uh, hope to post you up, keep you posted on updates with that from St. John. I'll send it back to you guys. Amanda, thank you very much. Meantime, that Amber Alert was issued about two hours after the boy was abducted. And that had many of you asking us why there was a delay. So our Taylor Vito looked into procedures for Amber Alerts, and as he found out, there are several steps that must be met before that alert hits your phone. With any crime or critical situation, I'm sure an investigator or first responder would tell you that working quickly is essential. At the same time, they'd likely say that it's also critical to get out the right information, especially when it relates to a child being abducted. This morning, it was around 5 a.m. when investigators say Justin Robertson went to the home of his estranged wife, took their kid, and left. But it wasn't until two hours later that an Amber Alert was issued and our phones went off. So why the delay? Well, the Sheriff's Office can't speak about this specific case. They note that they take Amber Alerts very seriously and that several agencies are involved when it comes to issuing one. First off, there's a statewide plan in Washington that relates to Amber Alerts, and that plan is authorized by state law. It details how alerts go out and who has the final call. Now, typically, if an agency wants to issue an Amber Alert, that request is approved by Washington State Patrol. WSP's communication center then makes notifications, and then they can extend the alert into other states. But but before all of that, according to Washington's plan, there are five steps that must be met before an Amber Alert can be issued. They include the child is known to be abducted and isn't a runaway. The child is believed to be in danger. The alert is activated within four hours of the abduction. There's enough descriptive info like where the abduction took place, what the child looks like, and what the abductor looks like. Finally, the incident has to be reported to law enforcement. The state's plan doesn't contain any language that makes specific references to parents, relatives, or people with custody playing a role in the abduction. The Spokane County Sheriff's Office adds that Amber Alerts are a very serious thing and it's a system that they never want to abuse. I'm Taylor Vito for Crime 2 News. With a panic button, they don't really know what's caused that, so they're going to take it as a higher priority and, and roll towards dispatch. Well, in this case, the suspect's wife alerted police by using a panic button in her home. So tonight we sat down with the security system expert to talk about how these work. We'll have more on that story coming up in our six o'clock newscast. Okay, switching gears to weather now. Hopefully you got a chance to get outside because today was 
kind of perfect. It was lovely. Tom Sherry in the Weather Center dishing out a beautiful forecast. Hi, Tom. <laughs> yeah, sunshine in the forecast for your Wednesday and not as windy as what we saw today. Temperatures will be just a tad cooler, but still pretty pleasant. Taking a look at the Doppler radar, we've got a few isolated showers. We might see a few sprinkles here in Spokane, but really the most measurable rain is right up along the Canadian border, so pretty much uh, out of the area. Uh, you see that uh, decreasing clouds expected late tonight and in the overnight hours. There's that sunshine tomorrow morning. Morning. Look for a low of 42 degrees, 66 the expected high on your Wednesday. And then for the weekend, it cools down. We've got a cool front moving in. It'll be breezy, slight chance of showers, partly cloudy both Saturday and Sunday. Daytime highs mostly in the mid 50s. I'll check the rest of your seven day forecast. That part's coming up in a few minutes. Sounds good, Tom. Thank you very much. National Teacher of the Year Mandy Manning weighed in on the current budget crisis facing school districts all across Washington. In the last few weeks, school district leaders have proposed significant cuts to education. They include staff layoffs and eliminating programs too. Creme 2's Alexa Block sat down with Manning. Manning is wrapping up her time as National Teacher of the Year. Tomorrow, a new teacher will receive the title. Manning says she has used this platform to advocate for students and educators, and it's not any different when it comes to the discussion of school funding and budget cuts. Next year's budget will be finalized in late August. It's, it's going to be hard to move somewhere else. thought that we'd not be here. Save our teachers! Save our teachers! Washington's school budget crisis has been brewing for weeks. Across the state, districts began looking at their budgets, preparing to make cuts. District leaders have said the new state funding model has left funding gaps. State legislators say they fulfilled their obligation to fully fund basic education. Caught in the middle are teachers, parents, and students. It is very scary, and it's not only scary in Spokane, it's scary across the state. The situation hits close to home for National Teacher of the Year and Ferris High School teacher Mandy Manning. Manning's former student teacher was among the 325 SPS employees to receive layoff notices. She is a compassionate, competent, excellent educator who really focuses on connecting with kids and making lessons engaging and she's the exactly the kind of educator we need in our schools and we're going to lose her if we don't fix this budget crisis. Concern for losing quality educators is felt by many. The layoffs have even sparked student walkouts and protests. Really good for them. For, for supporting their teachers and their educational support professionals and walking out on behalf of not only their um, educators, but also themselves. But it will take more than student demonstrations to fix the current funding issues in schools. Manning says she supports restoring local levy flexibility. State lawmakers put a limit on local revenue districts can raise when they approved additional state funding for basic education. We don't have the flexibility to spend the money that we have in the ways that we need to be spending them for our local communities. As the school funding discussion continues at the state and local level, Manning plans to continue to advocate for students and educators. Spokane Schools is a great place for kids to go to school. And if we continue on this pathway where we're cutting programs, we're increasing class sizes, it's not going to be good for our students. Now tomorrow we'll have more on Manning's year as National Teacher of the Year and we'll tell you about what she's been up to and what's next for her. In the newsroom tonight, Alexa Block, Creme 2 News.